we're going to look at how you can analyse even the most complicated pieces of music using images. Hello everyone, welcome to another video. In this video we're going to talk about the curious relationship between music and image. I'm talking about graphic scores and abstract paintings abstract such as those amazing paintings of music by the artist kandinsky we're going to look at how images can be used to analyze and even compose music you can apply these methods of analysis to both classical music and popular music and indeed you don't have to be able to read music to do this but if you can read music then that's great too because using visuals in this way will offer you a different useful method for analyzing music and it's not just music this method can offer you a way of analyzing abstract artworks too there's no need to be able to read musical scores to be able to appreciate or even compose experimental music music in image we'll start by looking at the paintings of kandinsky an abstract artist who painted music i first came across kandinsky when i was 16 during my gcse art and i thought i want to paint music and my teacher went have you heard of kandinsky kandinsky is reported to have heard tones and chords as he painted suggesting that combinations of colours produce vibrational frequencies akin to chords played on a piano. Kandinsky's art is described as abstract for many of his works. Music was an inspiration, such that he painted music in a manner akin to synesthesia. Kandinsky even compared painting to composing music, writing that colour is the keyboard, the eyes are the hammers, the soul is the piano with many strings. The artist is the hand which plays, touching one key or another, cause vibrations in the soul. Kandinsky is reported to have heard tones and chords as he painted. Another composer who did this was Messiaen and Beethoven and so many others. We're digressing. According to Kandinsky, instrumental timbres represent lines of different widths and colour. For example, dynamics can be represented by a line's sharpness or brilliance, where the pressure of the hand on the bow corresponds exactly to the pressure of the hand on the pencil. So if you had a violin, the bow pressure. Proper. Uh, corresponds to the, the one with the pencil. If you had a pencil, you know what I mean. Gerard McBurney, writing for The Guardian, writes that music and the idea of music appears everywhere in Kandinsky's work. Take his generic titles, compositions, improvisations and impressions. His mighty ten compositions were created over more than three decades from composition one in 1907 to composition ten in 1939. The first three were destroyed in the Second World War but enough survives in sketches and photographs to give an impression of what they were about and how they fitted into a sequence of paintings that are Inspires to be, in musical terms, a cycle of symphonies. The improvisations are, on the whole, less monumental, more dramatic. One writer compared them to concertos. Kandinsky himself called them suddenly created expressions of processes with an inner character. And as for the impressions, although this may seem less of an obviously musical title, we know that several of them were specifically written to respond to the experience of hearing particular pieces of music. Okay, to my mind, the term composition isn't specific to music. It's used in visual arts just as frequently. But I still take McBurney's point here. It is true that Kandinsky does use musical terminology to describe his visual work. For instance, regarding composition 6 in 1913, Kandinsky describes it as follows. On the right, slightly higher than the left centre, is a rough red-blue, somewhat dissonant centre with sharp, a little bit unkind, strong, very precise lines. Small forms of the painting demanded something producing a very simple and very wide effect at the same time, Largo. For this I used long solemn lines which I have already used in the composition for. I was very happy to see how this device which I've used once before produces a completely different effect here. To mitigate the impact of two dramatic lines, I let the whole fugue of pink spots of different shades play to the full. They induce great tumult with great peace and give objectivity to the whole event. A tremendous disaster which is taking place objectively is an absolute and at the same time independent warm song of praise, similar to the anthem of a new creation following the disaster. Let's take a look at Kandinsky's fragment two for composition seven, because the writers at albrightnox.org explain it as follows. Fragment two for composition seven is one of several preparatory studies Kandinsky made for the final painting composition seven, 1913, which point to the artist's interest in the relationship between music and visual art. This focus dates to the late 1890s when Kandinsky discovered the philosophy of architect and designer August Endel, German, 
1871 to 1925 while studying art in Munich. Endel believed that art could emulate the effect of music on the senses, creating beauty without reference to anything recognisable in nature. By the time Kandinsky created Fragment 2 for Composition 7, he had already formed a network of like-minded artists who called themselves Der Blaue Reiter, the Blue Rider. This informal intellectual and philosophical group focused on metaphysical and symbolic issues in art, avowing that abstraction was the pathway to a utopian society and a new spiritual age. They chose the colour blue as part of their name given its associations with transcendence, and the rider can be understood to symbolise energy, joy, positive action and transformation. In his own work, Kandinsky focused heavily on pure colour as a mode of communication. Throughout this painting, for example, light and dark shades of blue draw the viewer's eye to multiple abstract forms, leading the viewer to observe each element patiently and introspectively before experiencing the overall composition. So I'm talking about Kandinsky here as an example of the mindset one can get into when translating music into visuals. He's not the only artist who's done this, but his work offers a great example of this nonetheless. Now, let's look at image and music. Images have been used in music also. An obvious example of this is in graphic scores, also called graphic notation. This is when visual symbols, drawings, lines, squiggles, markings and so on are used to represent sounds in a piece of music. This is used instead of traditional music notation. Graphic scores come in many different styles, often it's a blend between image and music, musical notation. One composer strongly associated with graphic notation was the composer George Crumb, whose scores resemble various shapes. Graphic notation naturally results in aleatoric music. Aleatoric music is where the music is left to chance, determined by the performer. It literally means chance music. In other words, the sonic outcome is unpredictable to a certain degree. It can also require improvisation from the performer. Aleatory, as it's also known, goes as far back as Mozart. Musical dice games were popular in the late 18th and 19th centuries, so aleatory isn't new. But the use of graphic scores to portray aleatory evolved during the 1950s and was used predominantly in experimental music. Such use of graphic notation sought to free performers from the limitations of traditional Western notation and make them part of the creative process alongside the composer. For example, to perform the music of John Cage, you must work out his graphic scores. They're like a puzzle and pianist David Tudor was willing to do this. Not a lot of people were, so hey for Tudor. However, this mode of writing music will mean that different performers will produce different sonic outcomes of the piece. Slightly varied. If I say different, I mean slightly varied. I mean, the, de the degree of difference is unpredictable as well. Depends what the score looks like and how much the composer is willing to let go of the music. Naturally, this causes one to question who the composer really is. Is it the performer too? Is the composer eradicating themselves as a being in the process of writing music? Classic FM describes graphic scores as follows. Graphic scores serve a dual purpose. As well as looking beautiful, they explain abstract ideas about how the music should be played. In this piece written in 2006, each line represents a different instrument, with the colours and shapes informing how the music might sound. This piece is Picnic by Silla McQueen, and she writes that The graphic notation Picnic is of the nature of thought experiments. Mm. The viewer is invited to hear the music they portray with or without the mediation of actual musical instruments. If the score is to be performed live, the musicians may find the accompanying written notes useful guides for improvisation. I wrote the poem, Thank You, John Cage, on first encountering his work in 1980. He taught me the importance of space and silence as active components in both poetry and music. So there you have it. You don't even need the instruments to play the piece in order to perceive the sound world of a graphic score. You can just look at the images. This also implies that you don't need to be able to read music. Just interpret the visuals. If this is the case, then can we hear Kandinsky's paintings? Maybe we all have our own personal interpretation of what Kandinsky might have been hearing or seeing when he painted the pieces. Musical score and visual representation. Not only can graphic notation be used to give instruction on how to perform a piece of music, but it's also used to analyse, create a visual representation of a piece of music. For instance, Ligeti's articulation is an electronic piece of music that is visually rendered in this image here. According to Classic FM Online, 
Ligeti wrote this electronic piece, Articulation, in 1958. Although it existed as a recording, there was no score for musicians to see the music. Rainer Verhinger studied the piece in the 1970s and created this colourful explanation of the music with a vast key explaining all the colours and symbols. I suppose what Rainer Verhinger did is similar to what Kandinsky did. He heard the music and created a visual representation of it. The major differences here being, of course, that Verhinger intended his graphics to be followed as a score and would be. It's a very specific representation of a piece of music, whereas Kandinsky's is more abstract, perhaps ephemeral. As we can see, it's got a time axis. Have a look at the score. What signs and symbols do we notice in this image? What could the symbols represent sonically? There's no right or wrong answer. Remember that performers of scores are often given some creative freedom. I've written some examples of what the shapes could mean in a table here. As we can see, the lines, long, short, diagonal and vertical, I've suggested they possibly mean long, short notes, stable pitch, ascending pitch, descending pitch. The dots, short stabbing, percussion perhaps, maybe pitched. The shading, thick textures maybe, chords, airy sound, quiet. The circles could, and smooth corners could be smooth, sustaining or overlapping sounds. Sharp corners could be stabbing sounds. The giant X in circles, loud punctuating moments that stand out maybe, blank space, just as important, remember it could be quiet, pauses, and the time axis of course. Are sonic events positioned linearly from left to right? Should this matter? Are they on top of each other? You know, so on. I actually gave this lecture to non-music students and asked them these very questions. I also played them a mystery piece of music. Spoiler. It was actually Ligeti's articulation, but I didn't tell them this. While they listened, I told them to draw what they had heard on paper. Now, they couldn't read music. They just drew the shapes and lines and so on. I then asked them to look at each other's graphic scores and discuss with the group what they'd done, what their symbols meant, how they were translating sounds into shapes. I also asked them probing questions such as, what do the different symbols mean in terms of music? I let them describe them in layman's terms. Like, jumpy music means zigzag lines or whatever. I was basically getting them to talk about the music with reference to their graphic scores. I also asked them to describe the texture on musical aspects, again, speaking in layman's terms. I then asked whether they thought a performer could interpret their score, and would this performer play the music exactly as they heard it? Finally, would the viewer hear the music from their graphic scores, artwork or drawings? Why not? And does this matter? Interestingly, I found that one student focused on the overarching structure of the piece, one focused on the textures and timbres of the sounds, and one focused on the pitch and melodic shape of the sounds that they heard. Together, they'd analysed a piece of experimental or avant-garde or contemporary classical, whatever you want to call it, music, without being able to read music or without having really listened to this stuff before. So my point is, there's no need to be able to read musical scores to be able to appreciate music like this. Moreover, if a non-musician can appreciate and analyse this type of music with graphic scores, there's no reason why they can't create their own experimental music with graphic scores. I find it interesting that we can interpret sound with various visual symbols. Even without a key to determine these symbols, we get a rough idea of what the music might sound like.